You're listening to episode five of The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose, analysis of murder by Dr. Phil. In this, our final episode, you're going to hear more from my exclusive interview with Gypsy Rose Blanchard from Behind Bars. And I have some exclusive information that we have just gathered in the last few days about what is going on in Gypsy's life now. Things that I promise you haven't heard anywhere else because we have just learned these things. And some of it, I have to tell you, was upsetting to me. You'll hear about that as we go along. You may have heard that she is engaged. That much I did know, and you may have as well. But there's a lot more to talk about. She does share her plans for her post-prison life. We're going to discuss that. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm-fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. Now, as you've heard throughout this series, Gypsy Rose, in my opinion, was trapped in a real life horror story and it was getting worse by the day. Dee Dee Blanchard, who later became Dee Dee Blanchard, was horrendously cruel and abusive to Gypsy Rose. She had Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and I've been straight with you from the beginning that I disagree with many of my colleagues that this is a mental illness. I've been very forthright in telling you it's actually listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. So, Conventional thinking is that it's a mental illness. I disagree. I believe it is a severe form of child abuse that is perpetrated by those that have the worst form of personality disorder, where you call it psychopathic, antisocial, sociopath, whatever label you want to put on it. These are mean, evil people. And Dee Dee twisted Gypsy psyche. She altered her sense of what's real, convincing her, among other things, that she had multiple diseases and, in fact, was paralyzed from muscular dystrophy. And listen, when you're dealing with real life, things don't always fit into real clear categories. Round pegs don't fit in round holes. Square pegs don't fit in square holes. It's not always just black and white. I say she convinced her she was paralyzed from muscular dystrophy, but yet on the other hand, Gypsy knew she could walk. So was she really convinced she was, you have something severely wrong with you, and if you do try to walk, it could crush your spine and really create even worse problems. On another level, Gypsy thought, my mother's just lying to me. She knew she could walk, and when her mother wasn't looking, she did walk. But there was tremendous mind control here. Gypsy was isolated from the world. She was not allowed to have friends. She was not allowed to have even relationships with people. She wasn't even allowed to speak to her doctors. She relied on her mother for everything. Her mother told her what to think, feel. She even controlled what she ingested because she had a feeding tube in her. She absolutely controlled her. Now, Dee Dee told Gypsy that she had a number of diseases, as I said, including leukemia, shaved her head, pulled her teeth. I've mentioned to you that body image and self-image vary together. You learn about yourself by watching yourself master your environment. Try to think what a child would experience growing up if they never had the opportunity to observe themselves mastering their environment, overcoming any of the obstacles in their world. They never mastered going to school. They never climbed a jungle gym. They never ran down the street. They never won a race with their friends. They never learned that they could independently walk down the street, turn the corner, and go to the store or to a friend's house. She never learned 
any personal competencies. Now, you may be thinking, I don't want to be empathetic with Gypsy Rose. She's a murderer. She had her mother killed. But you do have to consider where those decisions came from in order to understand not only what took place, but why. This woman, Dee Dee Blanchard, brainwashed Gypsy and forced her to undergo more than 30 unnecessary surgeries. Now, think about that. At the time of this murder, she was almost 24 years old. 30 unnecessary surgeries. Think about the time spent getting ready for surgery, during surgery, and in recovery from surgery. These didn't start until she was 10, 11, 12 years old. So during 10 or 12 years of her life, she had 30 surgeries. That's an average of three a year. So every four months, on average, she was going through some kind of surgery. So she was either going through surgery or recovering from surgery her entire life. And the rest of the time, she was being pumped full of medications she did not need and living on a feeding tube with God knows what her mother was pumping into her stomach. So she would give her medication A, it would create side effects 1, 2, and 3, and those would match the symptoms that you would have for disease X. So she would go into the doctor and say, see these symptoms? She has X. And the doctor would go, well, she has the symptoms. Why would anybody lie? I hate to tell you this, but most doctors, most GPs, most internists have little or no training in something like Munchausen's by proxy. They just don't because they encounter it so rarely that they just don't spend a lot of time training in that. If she didn't get the diagnosis that she wanted, she doctor hopped. Somebody had to pay, and it was Gypsy that picked up the tab. She paid with her childhood. She paid with her adolescence. She paid with her teen years, and now she's paying with many years in prison. It sounds like I'm defending her, and I am defending her as an individual. I am not defending what she did. I said the system failed her. When two caseworkers from Child Protective Services investigated an anonymous report of abuse, probably from the doctors that saw through this sham, they came, visited, and closed the case, saying they found no evidence of abuse. You just have to wonder, how deep did they go? Did they talk to her alone? Did they get her away from the mother? Did they remove her from the home for a period of time? We have no evidence that she was ever removed from a home. And Gypsy knew that if she rebelled against her mother, what would happen? Because as we know, there are times that she did run away. And what happened? She got beat with a coat hanger. She got chained to a bed. We know what happened when she rebelled against her mother. So would she stand up and say, I'm glad you're here. Please take me away. What if they don't? What is she in for then? There's no doubt that if her mother was within earshot, if her mother at least convinced her that they were going to tell her what she told them, that she would be afraid to say anything. And let me say something about these caseworkers for CPS. It sounds like they blew it, and based on results, they did. But I have worked with these caseworkers, not these specific caseworkers, but caseworkers for Child Protective Services or the Department of Child and Family Services year after year after year after year. These are generally caring, competent people, but they've got 40, 50, or 60 files on their desk, and they have to cover those. They don't have the manpower. They are spread very thin, and they do what they can with what resources they have and things are going to fall through the cracks, and that's exactly what seems to have happened here. They left her with her abuser, and I'm sure if they knew then what they know now, they wouldn't have done it. They would have taken her out of that home. They would have put her with foster care. They would have put her with her father. would have put her with a family member. They would have done something, but they didn't see what we now know. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Think about all the people in power that could have reached down to save her, but just didn't do it, and how she felt that if anybody was ever going to save her, it was going to be herself. She feels powerless. She has no money. She has no support. She's isolated. She's in a psychological prison. She was at the end of her rope. I'm not saying she snapped. She didn't. This wasn't a snap situation. This was planned. It was thought through. But there was nobody to test it against. There was no one to challenge it and say, hey, let's think about what the world will look like the day after you do this. Let's think about what will happen if you get caught. Let's think about the reality of the first morning you wake up and realize your mother is dead. Now, she didn't know how to escape the abuse. She didn't have the intellect totally comprehend her situation, 
because she was so sheltered. She was trapped in this virtual bubble. Now, Gypsy was described by her mother as having an emotional age, an intellectual age of a child, eight or nine, somewhere in that range. When at 24, she was actually sophisticated enough to orchestrate the murder of her mother. And when I say orchestrate, she met this person. She groomed that relationship. She was able to get money together. She was able to send him money for clothes. She was able to send him money for tickets. She was able to timeline out this meeting at the movie to get him back down there again. This is not something an eight or nine year old child would figure out. So while she was naive and certainly not developmentally up to speed, she was no dummy. There's no question about that. She had enough sense to navigate her way around the computer and figure out the logistics of getting someone from 600 miles away to come commit a serious, serious crime for her. As you've heard me say, she didn't have her own computer. Her mother smashed that with a hammer because it threatened her isolation and therefore her control. But again, being pretty sneaky, pretty smart, pretty devious, she would get up at night and get on her mother's computer and create her own secret Facebook page, create her own secret relationships, and she found a lifeline. Turned out, partner in crime. She found somebody who was willing to murder her mother. She asked Nicholas Godijan, her internet boyfriend, quote, will you kill my mother for me? Now, what are the chances? Think about that. What are the chances that you would meet somebody on the internet that you could ask to come kill somebody for you and they would say, okay. Talk about a perfect storm of bad elements, but that's exactly what happened. And boy, was he controlling her as well. Like I said, when you've never had male attention and you hit puberty and the hormones and the sexual urges are raging, you're really vulnerable to somebody telling you what you have wanted to hear all of your life, that you're pretty, you're interesting, that you're desired, that you're wanted, that you're loved, that you're welcome somewhere besides here. They're cutting you up. They're doing surgeries on you every four to six months. They're taking things out of your body. They're torturing you. They've got a tube into your stomach. They're pumping things in there that make you sick. Your teeth are rotting out of your head. And somebody says, hey, come with me. I'll love you and nurture you and take care of you. You'd follow damn near anybody. It's a better alternative than you have. There was an absence of leadership. There was an absence of alternative. Just think what would have happened, as I said, if Godijan had been healthy. This was a Christian dating website. If it had been A man of principle, a man of values, a man with a moral compass who learned what was going on and actually said, I'm coming and I'm coming with help. I'm going to get to the authorities. I'm going to tell them what's going on and I'm going to stay on this until you have the help that you need. But that was not the case. Obviously, he turned out to be even more evil and dangerous than her mother. She went from the frying pan into the fire. Godijan was a predator of the worst kind. He took advantage of Gypsy. She was ripe to be exploited. She had zero self-esteem, zero self-worth, zero capacity to understand the perverted pathology of this very deranged man. She had nothing to compare it to. She had no baseline. She had no idea what relationships were supposed to consist of. She had only one significant relationship in her life, and that was her mother, who was killing her an inch at a time. So when Godijan turned out to be a cold-blooded killer who claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire named Victor, Gypsy said, well, okay. You heard me ask her, did you believe this? Did you actually believe this was a vampire? And she said, "Eh, sort of. I kind of went along with it and I kind of believed. She had nothing to compare it to. If you have no baseline, you have no psychological experience to say, is something fantasy? Is it bizarre? You don't have anything to compare it to. It's hard to understand how someone could believe that unless you've not ever had any experience. Gypsy Rose believed she could run away with this vampire, this vampire that was going to kill her mother and start a family. And you're probably shaking your head or laughing an anxious laugh right now because you're thinking, okay, how ridiculous does that sound? 
after the fact. She's going to run away with a 500-year-old vampire to Wisconsin and start a family. So she's going to get on the bus with a vampire and go to Cheesehead Country and have a bunch of little vampires. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be comical. And that's where the developmental delay comes in. That's where the naivete comes in. Because if your brain is developed and you have some life experience, you realize the ridiculousness of how that sounds. But if you're selling it to someone that is so naive and so desperate for an alternative, they'll believe about anything. She certainly didn't have the experience to predict the consequences of her actions because a lot of that comes with experience, right? Some things are one trial learning. Think about it. You slam your hand in the car door by accident. How many times do you do that? That's one trial learning. You go, no, not going to do that. You drop something in the sink and it falls into the garbage disposal while it's on and you instinctively reach down there to try to grab it and those blades get your fingers. That's one trial learning. You never do that again, right? It's experience. You learn one time, one trial learning. You only have to do that once. You learn don't stick your hand down the garbage disposal. But if you're a child, you don't know that, right? She could not predict the consequences of her actions. She was a child without experience making adult decisions that had very real consequences. Gypsy forgot one very important thing. Did it occur to you that he's dripping his blood all over the place and you're calling a cab? This is not real stealthy. I know. We were stupid. I can't say, oh, I wish we would have planned it out better or whatever. I just wish we wouldn't have done anything to begin with. I wish he would have just said, I will help you get out of your situation. How true. How things would have been so different had Godijan been her advocate. But Gypsy's naivete and Godijan's malignant psychopathy were self-sabotaging them from minute one. This case was over. This case was solved from the second she let him in that door. It was over. They had already created a trail. There was no chance they were going to get away with this. Let me ask you this. So they find your mother hacked to death. Your wheelchair's there, you're gone. How did you think this was gonna turn out? I thought that they would put out a missing report for me and that people would just give up. Lots of kids go and people go missing and then they're never found. So I thought that I'd be one of those cases that I'd just never be found. That's just one of the many breadcrumbs Gypsy and Godijan left along the way. It was not difficult for the police to find them. I know you've heard it said a million times, the prisons are filled with innocent people. Well, maybe, maybe not. I guess it depends on who you ask and how you define innocent. That thought is definitely a tale that the inmates like to spread. But Gypsy Rose will be the first to tell you she's right where she belongs, that she does belong in prison. Now, we recently talked to Gypsy on the phone, and she says that even though she realizes she is a victim... She is now holding herself much more accountable for her actions. So while she'll tell you, yes, I was a victim, I was being tortured, I was being abused in the worst possible way, I still am accountable for what I did. She'll own that. Now, she's serving a 10-year sentence, and although, like I said, she does think that she should be locked up, and she also thinks that she might be locked up for a bit longer, She thinks she's been there longer than she deserves, given the fact that the woman she conspired to kill was systematically dismantling her body one surgical procedure at a time. I do deserve to spend some time in prison for that crime, but also I understand why it happened. I don't believe I deserve as many years as I got. Does Gypsy still have some work to do to unpack everything that has happened to her? Well, everything she's done and caused to be done and the lives that have been ruined by her tragic choices? Well, there's no question that she was the driving force behind the murder of her own mother. She started the whole sequence of events that ended in her mother's stabbing death. As much as I say Godijan was an evil psychopath, he's not the one that brought this up. He didn't say, hey, how about we kill your mother and then we can run off together. She brought this up. She had the motive because she was the one suffering. At some level, do you think what you did is justified? 
No, nothing justifies murder. You know, it's just a perfect storm of bad circumstance and bad psyche. And I think that's why they were willing to make a plea deal with you instead of drop the hammer on you. Because otherwise, you could be here for 40 years. Or life without Pearl. So I think the system has acknowledged the uniqueness of the situation while also meting out a punishment that says we cannot condone this kind of vigilante justice of getting even. Mm -hmm. Not even God can change what has happened. How true. God can't bring Dee Dee Blanchard back to life. Murder is a deadly business. Murder is a business that deals in finality. And this is why I said earlier, think about your first experience with death. Did you really comprehend? Were you able to wrap your mind around the gravity, the finality of what death really meant? Because I don't think Gypsy did. Are you glad your mother's dead? No, no, sir. It broke my heart because I knew there was no going back, even if I wanted to. It's like part of me wanted to save her because there were good parts to her and she was my mother. And then the other part of me was like, if it just, it's gonna be over in a little while and I'll be able to live this good life where I'm free of her. Think about what Gypsy just said. She's still in a state of emotional confusion about her feelings towards her mother. I guess in a way that means she's maybe sorry about causing her mother's murder. On the one hand, she's telling me she's sad and upset that her mother is gone forever. But on the other hand, she's saying she's happy her mother is out of her life and she's no longer having to deal with the constant abuse. And we already know she concluded the only way out was for her mother to be dead. Not saying that was a right conclusion, but that was her conclusion. Now, Gypsy felt that one of us is not coming out of this alive and she didn't want it to be her. She made the choice to have her mother killed. Now, again, if you're not very sophisticated, let's think about it from that point of view. Doctors haven't saved her. Family haven't saved her. Child Protective Services, the government, has not saved her. And she's been unable to save herself. She ran away, and her omnipotent mother found her and drug her back. So at this point in her mind, I can tell you from a psychological standpoint, I 100% believe that she had reduced this to the equation, it's her or me. Not saying that was right, but in her mind, I truly believe she believed only one of us is getting out of this alive. To escape, I have to go through her, and that means I have to kill her. And if I stay, she is eventually going to kill me. She is going to continue to subject me to surgeries. She's going to continue to poison me until it goes so far I can't take it anymore. I don't come back from it. So in her mind, it's her or me. One of us is going to die. And she made the decision, it's not going to be me. I've suffered long enough. Now, she tells me she knows there is no justification for murder. She knows that. She says, I totally get that looking at it now, there's no justification for it. But on the other hand, she is, if not happy, at least relieved at the outcome. Now, this is a little hard to wrap your head around, but think about this. She's in prison for 10 years. Compared to spending 10 more years with somebody that is systematically dicing you up, cutting things out of your body pumping poison into your feeding tube. Now, if you had the choice, okay, would you rather spend 10 years in prison where you can go to the library and study, you can have a return to health, you can walk in the sunshine, you can talk to other women, you can learn about life, you're in a cage, but you can talk to people, you can go to school, you can learn, or would you rather spend those 10 years in a wheelchair with somebody poisoning you and cutting you up? Those are your A and B choices. Which would you choose? When you look at it that way, prison doesn't seem like such a bad alternative, does it? Now, at some level, I don't think she ever intended that she was going to be in prison. But when she says now she's relieved at the outcome, she's told me she's flourishing in prison. This was not a bad outcome for her. She's out. She has escaped the real torture chamber. All she's got to do now is put in some time here at this prison, and then she'll be out at 30 and has the next 50 years to live her life. Not necessarily a bad trade from her point of view. 
Right now, there's no doubt that her moral compass is spinning, and maybe yours too. None of us would condone murder and justify it for any reason. That's a very slippery slope. Where do you draw the line? I mean, it was like, okay, some people need killing. I mean, is that the theory? Some people just need killing. In this instance, as I've said before, many in the legal community have argued that this could be considered a special circumstance. In a way, what Gypsy did was self-defense. Others say that if Gypsy Rose could concoct all of this, why couldn't she have concocted an escape? The reason in the law that she didn't get a self-defense alternative here is that in order to assert self-defense, the law generally holds that you have to be in imminent danger. But that's really not true. You have to believe that you are in imminent danger. There's no alternative choice. It's kill or be killed in the immediate situation. But when there's not a clear and present imminent danger, the law says you have time to concoct an alternative plan. That's why self-defense was not an option here. That's why her defense lawyers could not plead self-defense, because there are elements to it. People think the jury just goes back there and decides guilty or not guilty. No, they go back there and say, okay, do you find the following elements to be true? Do you find that she was in immediate danger of being killed? And if the answer is no, move to the next question. And the answer here would have been no. She was not in immediate danger of being killed. So self-defense goes out the window. Some still say, yeah, this was a special circumstance. The immediacy was, could she immediately escape? And the answer is no. So her fate was sealed. But like I said, she was able to get on the computer, maintain a relationship for three years, get money, get him clothes, arrange the logistics, get him there. If she could do all of that, why couldn't she have gotten on the bus and gone to Wisconsin instead of him getting on the bus and coming to Springfield? She was of age. She could have left and never been compelled to return. But then that comes down to how much she understood, when she understood it, and what was her psychological capacity to act independently from this cruelly sick mother or even this perverted psychopath that she met online once that plan got put into motion. The sad fact is she clearly went from one sick controlling monster to another. And remember, she wasn't looking for a killer. She met Godijan on a Christian dating website. She didn't Google up monstrous killers. She was looking for a date. She was looking for someone to pay her some attention. She was looking for a decent young man. How different would it have been had she found one? You're very conflicted right now. I am. I mean, you feel very guilty on one hand and very exploited on another. And that's because both things are true. It is true. You were terribly victimized. You were tortured as a child year after year after year. That's terrible. If somebody did something that, like that to one of my children, I, I don't know what I would do. Clearly, Dee Dee got some kind of sick, demented pleasure from keeping Gypsy ill and making her appear to be paralyzed. Now, we now know enough to know her currency was multifaceted. The payoffs were many, and they were often. Gypsy's stepmother, Christy, has nothing good to say about Dee Dee. Oh, what I think of Dee Dee, she is a piece of work. I couldn't believe that a mother would do this to their child. How could any parent hurt their child? Why do I think Dee Dee did it? Dee Dee was an attention whore. She wanted to be famous, but she got it. Perhaps true, but who wants to be famous and known only for abusing your child and then dying in a bloody death from multiple stab wounds? Did that woman deserve to be savagely butchered for what she did to Gypsy? I haven't met anybody in the years that I've been involved in this case that would say yes. They would all say, of course not. Do I wish she was still alive? Yeah. So she could be the one in prison. The world's better off without her. Gypsy's better off without her. The authorities should have locked Dee Dee up a long time ago and, in my opinion, thrown away the key. But that didn't happen because the system that was supposed to protect Gypsy dropped the ball. And think about this. If the system didn't filter out Dee Dee Blanchard, who was a sadistic monster perpetrating these crimes across 10, 15 years, then who are they catching? She was a mother in genetics only, but biology does not make you a mother. I'm sorry, but I find it difficult to say anything nice about her. Maybe you can. I doubt it.
Didi took in hundreds of thousands of dollars in government assistance for the unnecessary surgeries, the unnecessary medications, and the general welfare payments. She was lazy. She didn't want to work, and she was willing to exploit her child so she could sit home. She got a free house built by Good Samaritans with Habitat for Humanity, tens of thousands of dollars in donations, all solicited on the back of her innocent daughter. I can't stop thinking of what horrors might be happening to Gypsy right now if Dee Dee was still alive. There's only so many things you can take out, and then you have to start amputating Gypsy's limbs. And you say, come on, Dr. Phil, how are you going to get a doctor to amputate a limb? Well... I'm telling you, all you got to do is create a cut, let it get infected, pack some dirt and germs in there, neglect that, put a tourniquet on the leg, let it get gangrenous, and then take her in. They go, oh my God, this has gone too far. We've got to take this limb off because she needed that child to be non-ambulatory. I've seen those very things happen. There's Munchausen's where the individual makes themselves sick or presents themselves as sick. There's Munchausen's by proxy where they do it to someone else. I've seen situations where they'll actually do it to themselves. They will cut themselves open and pack it full of bacteria, pack it full of dirt, pack it full of all kinds of contaminants and let it get so inflamed, so infected, so out of control that It's just oozing pus before they go to a doctor because they're looking for that, oh my God, you poor thing. So what I'm saying is Gypsy had what psychologists call a binary choice, an either or decision. In her mind, she could either tell someone her mother was abusing her or she could kill her. She tried the first and discovered nothing took place. She says she feared no one in authority would believe her because her mother had paperwork declaring her mentally incompetent. Obviously, she made the wrong choice, a horrible, irreversible choice. But she tells me that she was so afraid of her mother, she just couldn't choose the first option of telling anyone. Not her father, who her mother had convinced her did not care about her, nor her best friend, Aaliyah. This friend that you had, this next-door neighbor, Aaliyah, did you ever tell her secretly to the side, I'm in this wheelchair, but I can walk? I wanted to. I really did because I looked at her like a a sister, um, but I just didn't trust her that much. I thought maybe she'd tell my mom and that would get me in more trouble. Did you ever tell your dad? No, my mother would tell me such awful things about my father. She, they, my parents are divorced and my mother would tell me he abandoned us. He doesn't want anything to do with you. He's happy with his new family now. He doesn't love you. So I thought, why bother going to him with, when he won't care? As they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. Rod says he wishes Gypsy would have just come to him instead of resorting to murder. And when I say hindsight's twenty twenty, had Gypsy done that... I felt like an idiot. It made me feel so guilty. I felt guilt. I felt stupid. How can I let this happen? You know, why I wasn't there for... Gypsy Moore, I think that if I could have built that relationship with her, she wouldn't have hesitated to call me and say, Daddy, you know, this ain't right. Mom's making me stay in the wheelchair and I can walk. I have absolutely no doubt Rod would have done whatever he needed to do to protect his daughter. Because in coming to hear from him now and knowing who he is and knowing what kind of father he is and having met this man and looked him in the eye, I can tell you his heart is in the right place, and had he had any idea this was going on, I believe he absolutely would have done whatever it took to stop it. I believe he is a good man. I believe he would have been a good father had he known what was going on. You know, to this day, I'm sure you can understand, Rod still feels guilty. He still feels like he let his daughter down. And I guess in a sense, you can say he did. He did let her down because he didn't know what was going on. My father has, he has some guilt. And I try and tell him, don't feel guilty because you're in my life now. You're here now. And that's what's important to me. But these people with Munchausen's by proxy, they're really good at what they do. They are really good at what they do. They are hard to spot. What does that cause you to feel when you realize how viciously exploitive this woman was with you? When I first found out, I was so angry and hurt. 
and it's like I trusted her so much to do everything that she told me to do, be her good little girl like she wanted me to be. And every time I'd mess up, I'd always ever say, next time I'll do better, next time I'll do better. Don't get angry with me. And it just hurts, because every time she told me that she loved me, that she was trying to protect me, now that I know, the only person I need to protect you from is her. You can hear Gypsy's voice trembling. She still has a mortal fear of her mother, even though she knows she will never harm her again. Maybe it's PTSD, but that woman is still victimizing her from the grave. She is in her head. Gypsy lived by the phrase, mother knows best, so she always tried to please her mother, even as that horrible woman made her sick for real by pumping endless medicines into her feeding tube and hacked up her body from dozens of surgeries. And that's what ultimately pushed her to ask Godijan to step in. She had run out of coping energy. She just couldn't take it anymore. And right before this happened, she and her mother had a huge argument about her having to have another surgery. And her mother's story was, the doctor wants it. The doctor says you need it. And Gypsy saying, I don't care. I don't want it. She just didn't have it in her to go through it anymore. So part of her said, get out now. She had to know this was ramping up to something tragic. So she asked Godijan to kill her mother, and he willingly complied in the guise of his alter ego, Victor the Vampire, the 500-year-old vampire. As you know, Godijan claimed he had multiple personalities, but let's get real here. I think this was a convenient mechanism for him to justify some of the things that he did. There's a difference between manipulation and true illness. Whatever drove him, Gypsy certainly fell under his spell. I've not met Godijan. I cannot weigh in on what his pathology is. But you have to question, was he delusional enough that he truly believed that he was a vampire? That he truly believed that he had some kind of invisibility or invulnerability to the law? That he could do what he wanted to do and not be caught, not be held accountable? Was that narcissism? Was it psychosis? Who knows? But he certainly wasn't very good at it. Has he done this before? There's no evidence that he's ever been involved in anything of this nature. There's been a lot of questions about what drove him. Was he psychotic? It doesn't seem to me people that are psychotic don't have the ability to differentiate reality from fantasy. I don't think that was the case here from everything I can see and hear. I can't diagnose him, but I don't think that's the situation. Did he have multiple personalities? Doesn't sound like it to me. She's talking to him, and he says, hang on, I'll go get Victor. Now, I've talked to people that purport to have delusional identity disorder, and they don't quite switch from one to the other that conveniently. Just hang on, I'll go get him. It doesn't work that way. So I don't know really what was going on here or if this was just some sick, demented game that he played. He certainly had a sense of entitlement. He certainly gave himself permission to go in there and kill this woman that he didn't even know. What I do know is at the time I talked to Gypsy Rose, she seemed to have had some insight because she seems to realize now that a great alternative was available rather than handing him a knife and rubber gloves to kill her mother. You walked in the door, you handed him the knife, and he had the gloves. Sir. Minutes later, your mother was screaming your name for help. Mm-hmm. I just wish I could go back and walk in front of somebody, and none of this would have had to happen. But she didn't. We know she didn't choose to walk in front of somebody, and instead, she subjected not only her mother, but herself to some really horrific things because the night that he arrived, he told Gypsy to get in the bathroom and shave. Don't make a sound, get all the hair off. And she did exactly what he told her to do. After he had murdered her mother, he knocked on the door and Gypsy was, as she was directed, completely hairless. She says Godijan then took her to the bedroom, flung all of her stuffed animals off the bed and raped her. Gypsy says it was a violent assault. Remember, this was the deal Gypsy Rose made. She says Godijan originally wanted to rape her mother's dead body. And Gypsy said, no, I can't let you do that. And if you're going to have to rape somebody, then it's going to be me. Now, 
I get that doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense. But then he called a cab to take them to his hotel for the first leg of one of the most demented getaways imaginable. And what they did in that hotel room is shocking. Now, you have to remember as we go forward here, Gypsy Rose Blanchard and her boyfriend, Nicholas Godijan, had just committed the premeditated murder of her mother, Dee Dee. Then they call a cab and go to Godijan's hotel room where they made, of all things, a sex tape. Her mother's body is still oozing blood in the summer heat at home, and she, fresh from being violently violated is in a hotel room making a sex tape. Now, has the world gone completely insane? Admittedly, this could not have been a worse plan if you drew it in crayons. Well, comment on this for me. This is a video, part of one was taken in the hotel. (laughs) Hi, honey. That's less than 24 hours after your mother has been stabbed to death and you've been brutally raped by Victor, the 500-year-old vampire that you're now in a hotel room with. I wasn't myself. I had been taking narcotics, such as Xanax and Vicodin. I was high, very high. But this is the same man that had just brutally raped you. But he was a different persona now? Yes, he was. He was the loving boyfriend that was going to make all my dreams come true. The guy that stabbed your mother to death and brutally raped you and called a cab. As bizarre as that was, on the first leg of their getaway, a monkey wrench was thrown into the plan. It turns out the bus they were taking to Wisconsin, well, it was full. Because Gypsy didn't buy a ticket in advance, there were no seats left. Like I said before, these two didn't plan this caper very well. So now Gypsy and Godijan had to wait another day to get to his home in Wisconsin. The following morning, they walked across the street to the Waffle House for breakfast, and then they went to the post office. Why the post office? Well, Gypsy says that she thought bus terminals had metal detectors like airports, so they mailed the bloody knife to go to Jean's parents' house where they were ultimately headed. So it's got your mother's DNA on it, his DNA on it, his prints on it, your prints on it, and you mail it to his parents' house mm-hmm. where you are headed. Mm-hmm. You don't want a life of crime. You need to plan something else. I know. Because you're not very good at this one. No. Now, this is a big world out there. There are some other places to put this murder weapon rather than his parents' house where they're going. You've really got to wonder who is thinking for these people. Needless to say, another breadcrumb Gypsy left on the trail. A big crumb. After mailing the bloody knife, Gypsy and Godijan boarded the bus for the long trip from Springfield, Missouri to Wisconsin. Some 10 hours later, they arrived at Godijan's house, and that's when Gypsy starts to worry about her mother. A little late for that, but she is starting to worry about her mother. She says she was concerned that no one would find her mother's dead body, and she wanted her mother to have a proper burial. Now she's concerned about her mother. So she left another big breadcrumb for detectives to find, the digital kind. She logged on to the Facebook page she shared with her mother, the only other person who had the password, and wrote a post so vulgar it led her followers to believe the killer had kidnapped her and forced her to give up the password. Tell me about this post. Me and Nick made that post on her Facebook account. It says the bitch is dead. Says I f- slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet innocent daughter. Her scream was so f- loud. LOL. Why that particular message? It was alarming. The whole point of the post was I wanted her found. I couldn't stand the thought of her body just being there. And I remember something Nick had said when he first entered the house to kill her. And it was this bitch is dead and so my mother never cussed online she never put anything alarming and i thought that was alarming that would alert some of her friends to call the police well the alternative you could have just 
gone to a payphone, called police and said, go check this address, there's a dead body in there. Or you could have said, do you need to do a wellness check on XYZ address? I wasn't that smart. You could do that as opposed to four days after you hacked your mother to death saying that bitch is dead. That's a pretty aggressive tip. It was meant to be aggressive. It was meant to be alerting because I thought her friends would look at that and say, something's not right, so let's call the police. Well, that's an understatement, something's not right. But I do regret making that statement, not because it got me found and arrested, but because that was so wrong. It's not, it's not right. Now, you just heard her explanation of why she wrote what she wrote. I think an alternative explanation is that this is a lot of suppressed rage and resentment for her mother. This is just her way of venting and letting off steam about how she feels about her mother. I don't think this was just an accidental choice of words. But you told your friend you had a boyfriend, a secret boyfriend. I forgot about that part. Well, I guess that's another thing she forgot. And I know you have to be wondering, is she really this bad at this, this naive, or is she really wanting to get caught? I think they're just really this bad at this. I think these are just very naive, unsophisticated young people that just don't think ahead. I don't think they had any more idea in a goose what was going to be going on two weeks down the road. I think it was just, here we are today. Let's just think minute to minute. Remember, during the first few hours of the murder investigation, detectives spoke to Gypsy's best friend, her only friend, Aaliyah Woodmancy, who lived right next door. Now, Aaliyah reportedly saved the screenshots of her conversation with Gypsy because she feared that Godijan was an online predator who might take advantage of Gypsy. So investigators traced the IP address of that Facebook post and quickly discovered that it came from Godijan's house. The next morning, a SWAT team with a battering ram and police dogs found Gypsy and Godijan hiding in his closet. Now, again, think about that. This is their hideout, his closet. Where are you going? You're in the closet. There's one door in and one door out. This is their hideout. That's how naive this situation is. They mail the murder weapon to this house. Then they go to the house and start putting posts on Facebook. That was their plan B, hide in the closet. They were out in five minutes and taken straight to the local jail. So y'all pull this off. You get away with this for like four days before you're in custody. Yes, sir. And then you're in an interrogation room. So did you kill your mom? No, no, sir. Did you help? No, sir. Nicholas killed your mom? No, sir. I would never hurt my mom. Okay. Sweetheart, do you really want to date yourself? You're, you're dating yourself deeper, okay? No, seriously, I would never listen, hurt listen her. Listen to me. Listen to me, okay? I don't play around with that, okay? I'm not going to play around with this, okay? Sir, I didn't do listen anything. To me. You think that it's me? Why would you think that it's me? I have always listen, loved listen my mom. My mom and I are best listen, friends. Listen. Gypsy is in tears as I played the audio of her interrogation. What's going to happen to me, sir? After that interrogation, Gypsy was booked on suspicion of murder and put into a cell. Gypsy's father and stepmother flew to Wisconsin, and they visited her in jail. Got to see Gypsy. First time we had all seen her in a long time. It was probably 10 or 12 years since I had seen her. So we were excited to see her. She was excited to see us. That was probably the most nervous visit we've ever had. You know, it's behind the glass, and they bring her out, and everybody's kind of just telling her, "It's, it's okay, we're here for you, you know. And she was telling us she was sorry, and, and you know, at that time she was telling us she didn't have anything to do with it, which I understand completely, you know, her, her side and everything. There's a lot of holes in the story. I think we all kind of figured Gypsy had something to do with it. First time I saw her in prison, and she was telling us that she didn't know Nick had these multiple personalities. She didn't want her mom dead. At one point I said, you know, Gypsy, I said if you would have ran out of the bathroom I went try to stop him. You might not be here. I think he would have killed you. Was it justice? No. She didn't deserve what happened. If anything, she just deserved to be where I am. Did she warp you? Did she warp your personality? Did she warp your mind? Did she warp your moral compass? In the beginning, yes. And through 
my life, yes, and I'm trying to change that. She taught me how to be a good liar, a very good liar without any conscience. And I'm changing that. I'm trying to be a good person now. I don't want to be like my mother, and I'm nothing like her. If anything, I tell the truth too much now. <laughs> and Gypsy will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when she comes face to face with the vampire killer. There's an ancient Chinese proverb. You probably heard it in the James Bond movie for your eyes only. Before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. Gypsy Rose Blanchard exacted revenge on her mother, Dee Dee, orchestrating her murder in the most bloody and painful way possible. But in a way, she dug her own grave with the actions she took in the hours after her revenge killing. Gypsy spent her life living a lie, her mother's lies. Gypsy forgot if she ever knew about it, something called DNA. And DNA never lies. And of course, he's dripping his DNA from the bedroom to the bathroom, back into the other bedroom. Mm -hmm. And you got paper towels in the trash with his DNA all over them. Mm -hmm. And the stupid part is I actually wiped down the door handles. And you mailed the knife to his parents? To his house, yeah. You know, she is still kind of pointing fingers and putting blame on Godijan, even though she was the one that concocted this plan. She's the one that initiated the first thoughts about killing her mother. She's the one that admits she asked him the straight up question, will you kill my mother for me? Now, at that point, did she ever think it was really going to happen? I don't know. She thinks at that point she lost control and he took over and it did happen. The guy that stabbed your mother to death and brutally raped you. How do you feel about him now? I can't stand him because I went from one abusive person to another. I wish he would have been more responsible. He was the first person I ever told that I could walk. And yet I asked him a question. I asked him to kill my mother, but I didn't hold a gun to his head and make him do it. He seemed more happy to do it than anything. And that's why I can't stand him, is because he knew. I think he knew that he could easily get me out of that situation by calling the police, being responsible. But he wanted to do something bad, just for the sake of it, just for fun, because it made him feel more like a man. He had to prove himself. You think it was just a thrill kill for him? I think it was. Do you think he exploited you? I think he did. I think he used me to have his own means. He was a lonely person, not a lot of friends. Girls would never look at him. So I was the only one that would never tell him no. I would always agree to everything he said and do it with a smile. And I think he saw that in me from living with my mother. Like I had that submissive, low self-esteem, codependent personality that I think he, he could prey on that and he used me. You know, as I just listened to what she had to say at that point, it has become very clear to me that she has spent a fair amount of time in the prison library because she's talking with words that I just don't think were in her vocabulary before she got to prison. Psychological buzzwords such as submissive, low self-esteem, codependent personality. She's learning a symbol system to describe her reality, the way it was looking back on it and the way it is now. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying she's finding a way to represent all of this to herself so she can try and make sense out of it. I'm not sure she's doing it all in the correct way, but she's making an effort to try and explain this to herself where it's not just all pure evil. What do you think should happen to Nick? I think he should spend the rest of his life in prison. That was a quote from Gypsy when I did my prison interview with her. However, last November, Gypsy Rose returned to her adopted hometown of Springfield, Missouri for the first time since her mother's murder in 2015. She returned as the witness in the first-degree murder trial of her ex-boyfriend, Nicholas Godijan. But get this, she was the witness not for the prosecution, 
but for the defense. She wanted to testify on Nicholas Godijan's behalf because she had had a 180-degree turn in her feelings about what she wanted to do. When we talked to Gypsy recently, she said she wanted to help Godijan, so she had reached out to the defense attorneys and offered to testify on behalf of the man that had hacked her mother to death that fateful night in Springfield, Missouri. Now, as murder trials go, this one was very, very short. It lasted only four days, shorter than some trials for drunk driving. In his opening statement, Greene County, Missouri prosecutor Dan Patterson told the jury, go to Jean was a perverted man who got a thrill from killing Dee Dee. He was enjoying it. He was looking forward to it. He was excited about it. The prosecution says during his interrogation, Godijan confessed to killing Dee Dee. The law says a confession alone isn't sufficient to convict, but the prosecutor said the physical evidence found at the crime scene completely matched the confession. On the third day of the trial, it was time for Gypsy Rose Blanchard to take the stand. When she entered the courtroom, you could hear a collective gasp. She was in shackles wearing a gray turtleneck sweater over her jailhouse jumpsuit. Now the courtroom is silent as Gypsy begins her testimony. Remember, her voice is weak and squeaky, the result of surgeries to remove her salivary glands and on her esophagus. So the judge asked her to hold a microphone just so the jury could hear her. Did you and your mother obtain any kind of advantage by you being in a wheelchair? Yes, sir. What kind of advantage did you obtain? Financial. Um attention, charity. Financial need money? Yes, sir. Because they felt sorry for me. They believed the lie. They believed the fraud. Why did you not tell doctors that you knew you could walk? I didn't think that anyone would believe me. I thought they would eventually tell my mom and that would make my home life even worse for me. I feared her more than I feared anyone else. What were your feelings for Nick in the spring of 2015? I loved him. We had plans to marry. Did you do anything to prepare for having children with Nick? Yes. What did you do? I stole baby clothes and things for a child. And how would you steal baby clothes? I was in the wheelchair, so I would steal them from Walmart. At some point, you decided to kill your mother, is that correct? Yes. When was that? Thoughts of it started a year prior to the murder actually happening. Whose idea was it to kill your mother? Mine. Why did you want to kill your mother? Because I wanted to be free of her hold on me. Who initially brought up killing your mother? I did. I supplied the knife. Where did you get the knife? I stole it from Walmart. And why did you steal it from Walmart? Because I didn't see a knife that was sufficient enough in our own home. Where did they get the gloves? I supplied them. And where did you get where did you get the gloves? They were already in our house. How did Nick know when to do this crime? The time wise that that morning? I told him. Who planned this murder? I did. Did Nick do any of the planning in this murder? He may have had one or two. He decided what the weapon would be. Have you discussed alternative methods of killing your mother? Yes. What other alternatives had you considered? Poison, arson, a gun. Why did you not consider poison? It was too hard to find an odorless, tasteless poison. Why didn't you kill your mother? I didn't believe I could do it. I don't like blood. I don't like the sight of blood. Frankly, I'm too squeamish, so I just honestly didn't believe I could do it on my own. And you certainly didn't tell him to cut her neck down to the bone, right? No. The defense attorney argued that because Godijan is on the autism spectrum and has a low IQ, he didn't have the mental capacity to commit premeditated murder. That, to me, is a pretty big stretch. The question really comes down to whether or not he knew the difference between right and wrong at the time the crime was committed, And did he have the ability to control his impulse at the time the crime was committed? And 
I think there was no evidence presented whatsoever to suggest that he didn't know the difference between right and wrong or that he didn't have the ability to regulate an impulse. The jury didn't seem to have any trouble with that either because they deliberated for only two hours before they reached a verdict. And in this kind of a case, it probably takes at least an hour to read the instructions, elect a foreman, go through the procedures, and get the paperwork filled out, which means the actual deliberation was probably a matter of minutes. The debate was nil. As to count one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Nicholas Godijan, guilty of murder in the first degree. We assess and declare the punishment for murder in the first degree at imprisonment for life without the possibility of probation or parole. Godijan waved goodbye to his parents as he was taken away. Gypsy? Well, she returned to her prison cell in Chillicothe, Missouri, where she's serving out her sentence. How is your life here? My life's it's not bad. Lots of people think that prison is all of chains and bars, but it's not. I haven't gotten into really any trouble. I'm quiet. I'm a good inmate. And you have family support? I do. I do. And how about your mother's family, her side of the family? How do they feel about this? My mother's family is quiet. They don't contact me. I haven't spoken to them since before all this happened. But my father's side, on the other hand, oh, they've been wonderful. How often do you have visitors? Um, my family come um, probably about like four times a year. And um, my boyfriend comes probably about every month now. Who's your boyfriend? Um, it's a guy that I met since I've been in here, and he's a really, really good guy. He's living in Seattle right now. Okay, how did you meet him over the internet? Um, no, no. Um, he watched a documentary about okay. me and wrote me, and um, I never knew what it was like to have a healthy relationship. His only relationship I knew was my mother and Nicholas, but now I see how wonderful it can be. Yeah, maybe checked him out and a little bit about him? Yes, my parents are fine with him. When we talked to Gypsy recently, she told us that the man's name is Ken from Seattle. She says he's recently met her father and stepmother, and they approve. She says she's also spoken to Ken's mother and plans to meet her in person before the wedding. Gypsy says all family members on both sides are very supportive. Gypsy says Ken is planning to move from Seattle to Kansas City, Missouri, so he can be closer to her, just about 75 miles. She says Godijan wrote a letter to her, a long letter, she says, where he professed his love for her and acknowledged that he knows she's engaged. Now, Gypsy says that Godijan wrote that he wanted to be the one to marry her and would give her one month to choose between him and Ken. Now, Gypsy said reading that letter was a very emotional experience, and she actually debated whether to write him back, but in the end decided to stick with Ken, who she calls great, rather than going back to a man with a toxic past. I have to say... That was very unsettling to me. This whole thing about Ken and Godijan, the fact that she would want to go and speak on Godijan's behalf at his trial is unsettling to me. The fact that she would receive this letter professing his love and debate whether to respond and be on the fence about, well... Go to Jean or Ken, go to Jean or Ken, and even have that conversation with herself for a millisecond is unsettling to me. I'm glad she made the decision to not pursue a relationship with Go to Jean, but I am not happy that she's made a decision to pursue a relationship. The last thing she needs to do right now is commit to a relationship with anyone other than herself first her immediate family second. There's a lot going on with Gypsy right now. I truly believe that she's suffering from PTSD. I can only imagine what the experience has been with everything she went through 
from her mother and the way she treated her, the guilt that she's feeling, the confusion that she's feeling, having been a party to her mother's violent and brutal death. I know that the prison system, particularly the prison at Chillicothe, does the absolute best that they can with the women they have there, but their limited resources are what they are, which tells me that she has had very little help in healing the open wounds that exist, and she is anything but ready to enter into a relationship with someone else. You've got to clean your own house first. You've got to be your own best friend first. Because anytime you enter a relationship, you bring with you the baggage of life, your life. And you either contribute to that relationship or you contaminate that relationship based on what you bring with you when you arrive. And in looking at Gypsy's history, it doesn't take long to predict that she is going to contaminate a relationship rather than contribute to a relationship because of all of the unresolved issues and unhealed wounds that she has when she enters a relationship. She is sealing her fate, in my opinion, if she doesn't turn all of her attention to a return to psychological health before she tries to become part of a relationship. Bad decision, in my opinion, and I'm going to make sure she knows how I feel about that. When I was at the prison, I was told that Gypsy was a model prisoner. I have since learned that she has continued to be a model prisoner and, in fact, has nearly completed her high school studies and has a passion for cosmetology. Quite an accomplishment for a young woman who never made it past the second grade and went through all of the trauma she went through across so many years. Dee Dee didn't allow her the opportunities for a lot of stimulation for brain development. What's a day in the life like for you? I have a job. What's your job? My job is working on my housing unit, janitorial services. Uh-huh. So I clean. Um, I go to school in the morning, um, go eat, go to the library. Is your life ruined? No, sir, it's not. How long are you going to be here? I see the board in 2021. So let's say that you are granted parole at that point. What do you hope to do? I hope to do everything that I've always dreamed of. I have a wonderful family that loves me and supports me. My father is back in my life and my stepmother, who I just call mom now, she's amazing. Gypsy and I talk two or three times a week, sometimes more. Oh God, what don't we talk about? Um, you know, girl stuff, um, you know, some things that, you know, are going on in there. People that write her, she'll tell me, oh, I got a letter from France or I've got a letter from, you know, Alaska. You know, she, I mean, people from all over around the world write to her. She can't wait to, you know, go fishing with her dad. Much like I had alluded to earlier, Gypsy's father, Rod, says he believes prison has done a world of good for Gypsy. It's hard to imagine a father saying that, but like I said, in comparison, Gypsy is safer in prison than she was in her own home with her own mother. At least in prison, no one is poisoning her or cutting her up. They are rewarding her, a kind of reverse incentive system where her mother rewarded her for incapacity instead of capacity. Here at the Chillicothe Correctional Institute for Women, she is rewarded for doing well. She is rewarded for doing things that prepare her to succeed in life after prison. Gypsy's whole demeanor as she grew older, it didn't change much. She stayed, you know, when she was 10 years old, she sounded the same way at 15 and and even 20. So I believe that, you know, that was something, another thing that Didi just made made her do, made her act, act childish and everything. You know, after a couple visits with her, it seemed like she matured 10 years. Just, just talking to her a couple times, visiting and everything. So I think she's able to be herself now and she seems much more mature, but I think a lot of that was was Dee Dee too, Make, making her act like that. I'm, I'm still happy for her, that thinking that I mean she's still she's, she's still going to be pretty young when she gets out. So we'll be able to we we'll be able to do a lot. She'll be able, she could still have kids, get married, and everything. Gypsy tells us she is petitioning for an early release from her 10-year sentence. Her father, Rod, is behind the petition drive. I've started a petition to the governor of Missouri on uh, Change.org. It's called Free Gypsy Rose Blanchard. We're hoping that 
you know, we can get the word out and, and help her maybe get her sentence shorter or probably think like maybe a five-year sentence would have been more reasonable or, you know, maybe five years of, of I'm not going to say a mental hospital, but something less restricted or, or, or something on the mental side of, of the correctional uh, programs they have. And if you have a mind to support that, on our website associated with this podcast, we're going to have a link to that petition where you can sign up and support that petition for early release. I have to tell you, I support Gypsy's early release. I don't think she should just walk out that prison door and be standing on the street. But I do support her being released from the prison early and perhaps going to a supportive environment where she's able to get psychological help and transition her into society. To just give her a shock release and put her on the street would do her no good, in my opinion. But to put her in some kind of supportive environment where she did have therapeutic experiences and help with anxiety, depression, PTSD, and life skills to become a contributing member of society would serve her well. And I think she would be very passionate about learning the things that she needs to learn to do well. I believe she has maxed out what she can get from the prison experience. I think she's served time. I think she's made the most of that time. I think she needs to go to the next level of confinement and try and make more strides than what she's made so far. You know, I spoke to Gypsy like a Dutch uncle and gave her what I believe is some much needed advice, some truth that she needed to hear. I hope that you put a frame around this I hope you own your bad decisions and you find your way to forgive yourself for those things. And I hope you find your way to forgive your mother for the things that she's done to you because you have suffered terribly. And if you don't find meaning to your suffering, if you don't use that suffering and use this suffering and use the tragedy of your mother's loss to create some meaning in this world, then it will make you insane. I will try and do something important to help others. Well, the first person you got to help is yourself. The future hasn't happened yet. The past is over. The only time is now and what you do in this moment. And what you've got to do is not make excuses for what you've done, but own that that's 100% wrong and equip yourself with more powerful, more empowering coping skills so you don't get in this situation again. And if you can use your life, if you do become an advocate, if you do have opportunity to speak, you do have a compelling story. But you're not anywhere near equipped to tell it at this point because you've got to find every lesson from that story that you have right now because what you have right now is a compelling story, but there's not a takeaway from it yet. I think the biggest hill that Gypsy's going to climb at this point in her life and maybe for the rest of her life is forgiveness. Forgiveness for her mother and forgiveness for herself. That's very difficult. And you're probably sitting there thinking you would find it hard to forgive someone that had done to you what Gypsy's mother did to her. But I believe holding a grudge is like letting someone live in your head rent free. That's just not a good thing to do. They dominate you. They control you. And to have bitterness and anger towards her mother is allowing her mother to control her from the grave. Because when you have bitterness and hatred towards somebody, you are locked in a bond with that person until you finally let them go and say, I forgive them. Forgiving them doesn't mean what they did was okay. Nothing will ever make what Dee Dee Blanchard did to her daughter okay. Has she paid a high price for it? She has paid a high price for it. She paid with her life. Was that a just punishment? No, it was not a just punishment. And it didn't give a sense of justice to Gypsy. All it did was complicate things even further. And Gypsy needs to find it in her heart to forgive her mother and to forgive herself because she made a serious, serious mistake. And she's paying a price for that mistake. And she will pay that price for the rest of her life. If she lives to be 100 years old, she will live knowing that she conspired to have her own mother murdered. And that's something that she'll never forget, but she's going to have to find a way to forgive. And to do that, while difficult, 
is the only thing that will ever truly put this in her rearview mirror. And this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about has to get resolved before she gets into a relationship because it will contaminate any relationship she gets into. She has unfinished emotional business with herself and with her mother. And until that's resolved, she simply cannot move on. You know, when I say there's not a takeaway yet, by takeaway, I mean you've got to find meaning to suffering. You've got to make sense out of what you've been through. You've got to make sense out of what happened. Because if you don't, then all you did was suffer. If you find some purpose in it, if you find some meaning in it, if you find some reason that you went through it, then it at least becomes tuition for the lesson that you've learned in life. You've got to find something that you take away from what you went through, what you did or didn't do, that you can use to inform your life going forward, that you can pay forward to other people, that you can use to make this world a better place. If you just went through it and you learn nothing from it, you take nothing away, then that truly will lead to depression, anxiety, and all forms of mental illness. And I really hope, again, that this unfinished emotional business will lead Gypsy to some kind of answer, some kind of resolution here. She had alternatives that she didn't choose. She made choices that she didn't want. She made mistakes in a relationship that cost her mother her life and cost Gypsy years in prison. And now she's getting ready to get into another relationship with someone she's never met because that's her standard. The takeaway may be, I need to know a whole lot more about who I get in a relationship with before I get in a relationship with them. And look here, I'm using the same selection standard I used for the last person who hacked my mother to death. What do I really know about this person? He has a computer. That's all I really know about him. So I need to take it slow and meet this person and meet people who know this person and let them know me. I need to slow down and let things happen in the real world instead of on a computer screen. You do have to wonder why someone would just pick out of all the people in the world someone that is in jail for second-degree murder to be their significant other. Why? You've got to ask a lot of questions. Why would someone choose someone in jail for murder? I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm not saying that that can't be a relationship that's successful and that those can't be two quality people. But don't those questions bear asking. Learn from what happened before. Number one, you did survive. And number two, you need to advocate for transparency and care. The problem here is that you had multiple doctors that your mother, as soon as they told her something she didn't want to hear that did not go with her narrative of you being deathly ill, she would doctor hop. Mm -hmm. And that's how we are having an opioid epidemic in America right now because people doctor hop and Dr. A doesn't know what Dr. Q is doing. And I condemn what you did in the most rigorous fashion. And in the same breath, I say I am so terribly sorry for what you went through. The system failed you. And I do want to help you have a second bite at the apple. I do want to have you help you have a chance to redeem yourself in this life. And I will keep that promise to help Gypsy become a productive member of society once she's freed. And I look forward to it. I plan on living a good honest life. No more crime for me. I wonder if you believe her. I can tell you that I do. I've seen positive development in this young woman. Did she make a bad choice? Of course she did. Absolutely she did. But she owns it and she's learning more and more what that means every day to own that decision. She has genuine remorse and she has a desire to do better. Has she resolved the conflict in her mind? No, not even close. Is her moral compass on true north? No, not yet, but it's headed that direction. She needs to make a lot of right choices, first small choices that are right, and then start making some larger choices that are right. Is she still vulnerable to exploitation? Without a doubt she is. She is still naive. She still lacks life experience. When she's released on parole or probation, she needs to be phased back into society like I was describing earlier. She never lived independently or in society for one minute of her life. 
in a strange way, Gypsy is like someone that was found in the forest, someone who hasn't been around other people for years. She has never lived in society. She's never had a smartphone. She's never been to the mall and gone shopping. She's never figured out what things cost. She's never driven a car. She's never had to figure out a budget. She's never gone through any of the things that we all have to navigate. Scams on the internet, people calling you up on the phone and scamming you out of money. She's never gone through all of the things that people are bombarded with every day. She's never gone out with somebody that says, hey, you want to drop some acid? You want to do some ecstasy or what? She doesn't know about these things. She is vulnerable. There's no doubt she needs to be phased back into society. Maybe spend time at a halfway house in that structured and supportive environment that I was talking about, or she will be easy prey for the next monster. Look, nobody ever said life was fair. Nobody promised it would be a success-only journey. I do think we have the right to expect our own people, our own mother and father, not to conspire to destroy our lives. What happened here with Gypsy Rose is tragic. Her choice was tragic. She chose to cause death and destroyed two lives, her mother and herself. She has the chance to rehabilitate her life. She has a second chance. And I believe some criminals should be rehabilitated, not just punished. And Gypsy Rose should be the poster prisoner for that. She is the person that deserves rehabilitation because she's never had a chance at life. Her crime was heinous, but from a psychological standpoint, if anyone ever deserved a second chance, it's Gypsy Rose. Really, her second chance is her first chance. Is she at risk for killing again? I don't think so. Will she be crumbling from depression, anxiety, PTSD, or get so overwhelmed with life that she would be suicidal? She is a high-risk candidate. Let's not let the system fail her yet again. For once, let's put a red flag on this one. Let's give her a chance to show what she's made of. She's paying her debt to society. Once that debt is paid, let's give her the chance that she deserved from the beginning. This has been the story of the killer thorn of Gypsy Rose. I would love to hear what you think. I want to give a special thank you to Warden Chris McBee from the Chillicothe Correctional Center in Missouri for allowing me to visit with Gypsy. Warden McBee is a good man, and his prison is very well run, and he makes sure that the inmates have access to education. He does it right. By now, I hope you've hit subscribe. If you haven't yet, well, I hope you will. I've got some more true crime podcasts coming up that I know you'll want to hear. I don't intend to report just on what happened. I'm going to take a deep dive and break down and analyze the psychology behind the murder, behind the crime, and try to give you a greater understanding. People ask me all the time, Dr. Phil, who does that kind of thing? Well, when they ask me, it's not a rhetorical question, and I intend to answer the question. There are predators among us, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about this. Watch for my upcoming true crime podcast, Analysis of Murder. You can download them on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and wherever else you find your favorite podcast. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for listening.